and said unto him, Behold, thou art but a dead man. For the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. This is before the law. Before the law, adultery was condemned by God. Taking another person's wife was condemned by God. Living with another person's wife was condemned by God. Abimelech had not even touched Sarah. Nothing had happened in between them. And yet God said, you are a dead man. Look at verse 4, but Abimelech had not come near her. And he said, Lord, will thou slay also a righteous nation? Said he not unto me, she is my sister. And she, even she herself, said, He is my brother. In the integrity of my heart and innocency of my hands have I done this. And God said unto him in a dream, I know, yes, I know that thou didst this in the integrity of thine heart. For I also withheld thee from sinning against me. Therefore suffered I thee not to touch her. You know there are some people that feel that they can go so far with another person's wife. And then they discuss intimate things and they talk about this and talk about that. And they say, well, I didn't commit any sin with her. It's only that we are friendly, only that we are close. God is against that. God is against that. He doesn't want you to be any emotionally close, psychologically close. He doesn't want you to be kind of physically close to another person's wife. Even before the time of the law, it was wrong. It says in verse 7, Now therefore is told the man his wife, for he is a prophet, and he shall pray for thee, and thou shalt live. And if thou restore her not, know that thou shalt surely die, thou and all that are thine. You see how serious the matter was at that time, even before the time of the law. So don't ever say, well, we cannot be as strict today because, you know, we are not under the law. Before the law, it was that strict that God brings judgment on adultery, on fornication, on uncleanness. On that kind of evil lifestyle. We're looking at Genesis chapter 38 before the Lord. Genesis chapter 38 verse 24. It says, And it came to pass about three months after that it was so Judah, saying, Tamar, thy daughter-in-law, has pledged the harlot. And also, behold, she is with child by Wadom. Remember? All mongers and adulterers, God will judge. And Judah said, Bring her forth and let her be burnt. Look at the punishment, even before the law. Although, if you read the whole story for Judah, that was responsible, but you didn't know. It's like David bringing judgment upon the person that has done that evil thing until Nathan said, Thou art the man. The point is that before the law, it was a very serious matter this adultery, this fornication. Because the law had been reaching in the heart of everyone. How about during the law? At the time of the law, now God gave Moses the law. And he gave it to the nation of Israel. During that period, what was God's attitude against adultery? Against fornication? What was God's attitude against immorality and uncleanness? We're looking at Leviticus chapter 20 verse 10. Leviticus chapter 20. We're looking at verse 10 during the law and see God's attitude to adultery, fornication, immorality. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. You see that it was a serious matter. It's not something that you know somebody will say, after all, what have I done? After all, what is so serious in this? It was so serious that it carried death penalty. And today, if anybody commits adultery, even though man might not see you, there's a death penalty. You lose the life of God in you. You lose eternal life. You lose that everlasting life that you said you've got because adultery carries death penalty. You are separated from the life of Christ, from the life of God. You become like a piece of bread, lifeless piece of bread. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 6. Proverbs chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 27. Proverbs chapter 6. We're looking at verse 27. Can a man take fire in his bosom and his clothes not be burnt? 
can one go upon hot coals and his feet be not burnt so he that goeth to his neighbor's wife whosoever toucheth her shall not be innocent that's another way of saying he's guilty that's another way of saying he comes under condemnation your conscience will condemn you the word of god will condemn you the angels of god will condemn you god in heaven will condemn you and life and time and eternity will condemn you when you go into immorality like that fornication or adultery and it tells us as we go on in verse in verse 32 but whosoever committed adultery with a woman lacketh understanding and then it says and he that doeth it destroys what tell me out loud his own soul he destroys his own soul he wound and dishonor shall he get and his report shall not be wiped away that means that during the law it was serious before the law it was serious but people were now in the dispensation of grace dispensation of love and dispensation of mercy were on this side of the cross what does the bible have to say for us who are now in the dispensation of grace we're looking at first corinthians chapter 6 first corinthians chapter 6 Verse 9 and verse 10. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor the effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. It's telling us that adulterers will not inherit the kingdom of God. Fornicators will not inherit the kingdom of God. Unclean people, unrighteous people, immoral people will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's telling us that even after the cross, in this dispensation of grace, that those who live in adultery, in fornication, the means and the forfeit, the kingdom of God. It says, don't you know that God will punish all unrighteousness, all immorality. Look at verse 15. Know you not that your body, your bodies are the members of Christ. Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? Good for beach. It says when you're going to immorality like that, it's like you're making the member of your body, you're making the members of hallowed tree. It says, God forbid, what? Know ye not that he which is joined to an hallowed is one body for two, says he shall be one flesh, but he that is joined unto the Lord is one spirit, flee fornication. What do you do to fornication? Tell me, flee, run away. A kind of unreasonable man, a kind of unclean man, a backsliding man is coming to you and he's talking some things and you're an, you're intelligent. Even if you're 10 years of age as a girl, you're intelligent enough to know when somebody is talking rubbish and when they are talking things that lead into sin, into immorality, he says flee. Don't just stay there and stand there or sit down there and be smiling and be asking questions and be saying, what do you mean by this? What do you mean by that? It looks like you are careless yourself. Like you want to lose eternal life yourself. It looks like a candidate of hell yourself. It says once a man, a woman begins to talk rubbish to you, flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinneth against his own body. It's telling us that it's not something we should play with because it will launch a sinner, a backslider in hell fire. We're looking at Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. I'm reading from verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery. See the way it starts, the works of the flesh, and the very thing on the, on the top of the list, adultery, and fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, and hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, sedition, heresies, envies, murders, the drunkenness, revilings, and such like. And you know, if somebody said you're a drunken man, that will hurt you. Say, no, I'm not, I can I don't, I don't take alcohol. Since I became born again, I never touched alcohol in my life. If somebody says you're a witch, you say, how can you say that? You say, 
take that bag. Don't call me a witch. I'm a child of God. I about adultery. I about fornication. They're in the same class. They're living in the same room. They're in the same environment. The adulterer. The fornicator. The witch. The drunken man. The drunkard. They're all in the same boat. And if you hate witchcraft, and if you hate drunkenness, you must hate fornication and hate adultery. And if you say temptation, what if you are tempted to wizardry, witchcraft? Will you submit? Of course, no. What if you are tempted to drunkenness? Will you submit? Of course, no. Oh, you see, then you are easily yielding to fornication and adultery. It's the same judgment that comes upon them because it says in verse 21. As I have told you also in time past, that they which commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are we so foolish that you want to have what they call pleasure for 10 minutes or one hour even, and then for all eternity, 100 years, a thousand years, a million years, a trillion years, for all eternity, you are born in the lake of fire. For what? The wise, I pray God will keep us from sin in Jesus' name. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. I read from verse 28. Romans chapter 1, looking at verse 28. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to the reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What does that mean? They don't like to retain God in their knowledge. Anybody coming to church even for only one time, like you have come today, you have the knowledge of the word of God. Marriage is honorable. Instead of going to commit sin secretly, go get married. Get married. That's good. That's honorable. That's sacred. That's permissible. But you are acting as if you are strong in the open. And then you are walking about as if you are free. And internally, secretly, behind the curtain, you are committing adultery or fornication. And, they, and you have the knowledge that it will land you into hellfire forever and ever. And it says, instead of living such a life, hypocritical life, instead of living such a promiscuous life, careless life, or clean life, and people are thinking you're a good man, you're a great woman. It says, go and get married. And then you stay with your wife and stay with your husband. It says, if you don't do that, and then you're pretending you're righteous, you're strong, and you're holy, and then you don't get married, and you're living in sin privately, then it says, God will give you a reprobate mind. I say, God forbid. Say it. God forbid. Uh-huh. Go and get married. Then somebody comes, and then... He wants to get out of this kind of predicament. Let's help them. Once the people are born again, and then everything is all right, let's let them go ahead and get married. They don't have a mansion yet. They'll take care of that. They don't have, you know, you know, two bedroom apartment. Don't worry about. They'll take care of that. Where is the person living now? Wherever he's living, take the wife there. They live together, and the woman knows that. Lady, the man does not have two bedroom. Are you ready? I will go. I said, I will go. What if they don't have fridge? My daddy and mommy did not have fridge when they got married. What if they don't have this or that? Don't worry, we're talking about eternity, about sinning. We don't want these young men to, you know, just stay like that because of a fridge, because of a house, because of this and that, and then they're living in sin privately. You ask them, those people that in Koshi for nine months or one day in Koshi for two years, I was saying, How are you doing? We're doing well. Who knows? They might be committing fornication privately. Release them, let them get married. Then our church will be holy, yeah. our church will be righteous. And then our workers, everybody will be living clean life. There will be no guilty conscience. Even if you are living in one room. If you are living in one room and your conscience is clean and clear, pure and holy. That's better than waiting for two bedroom apartments and then you are living in sin secretly. Get married and remain holy. Give me a good amen. amen. Verse 29. Be filled with all unrighteousness, fornication wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, and, and then it says, 
inventors of evil sins, boasters, proud, despiteful, disobedient to parents without understanding and covenant breakers and without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, who knowing the judgment of God, that they which commit such things as adultery and fornication and all the other things, they are not only worthy of death, but they have pleasure in them that do them. The people that encourage sinning, that encourage evil, it says that God is going to judge them severely as well. Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 20. Remember again, age of grace, dispensation of grace. At this time, not Jesus has gone to heaven. And the church has now been established. And now the Lord is speaking from heaven unto the church. And he's talking to this church in verse 20, Revelation chapter 2. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou permittest, allowest, sufferest that woman, Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to think sacrifice unto idols. The Lord is saying that she is the responsibility of the pastors, of the leaders, of our coordinators and group coordinators of our verses to keep the church clean, keep the church pure, keep the church holy. It is the responsibility of every sectional leader to keep the church clean and keep the church pure. Hey, don't you understand? Whatever name we are calling you, sectional leader, we are calling you coordinator, we are group coordinator, overseer. The bottom line is you are a pastor over those people. We say house fellowship leader, that's a pastor. In that little church right there, we say zona leader, that's a pastor. In that local church, little church there. And you have a group of people that the Lord is helping you to watch over. That the Lord is making you, maybe you are in the ministry and they are doing this and doing this. And God has given you the responsibility of being the leader over them. You are the pastor over them. What senior pastor? We have the other, you know, normal pastors, and that's who you are. And then you have a Jezebel there that is making people, making those men to commit sin, to lust, and to do evil. And they're good. They have talent. They have gift. They have ability. That's why they are workers. That's why they are able to do this and that. But you are supervising them. You are looking at their lives. You are looking at their ministries. And there's a Jezebel there that makes my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, a bed of affliction, and them that commit what? Tell me. You know, it calls, what does it call it in verse 20? Latter part of verse 20. To commit fornication and then in verse 22 that commit adultery you know there are people that want to draw some fine lines and hey, that one is fornication that one is adultery sin is sin everything is evil and if you're doing anything that only a husband is permitted to do with the wife and that person is not your wife not your husband that's immorality that's fornication that's uncleanness that's adultery and whatever name we call it it carries heavy penalty in the sight of god it's a great sin and it causes great great judgment behold our casting to a bed